The peace of Christ be with you. Give yourself the gift and give your neighbor the gift of taking about three deep breaths that your awareness might open to recognize the presence of the living spirit in, with, and among us. Friends, let us worship in beloved community. Please rise in body or spirit for the call to worship. Friends, in Christ you have been born anew, born of the Spirit. All that is in Christ is an open spirit and God's grace. Let us be disarmed that we might encounter 
one who desires our well-being. Let us come into God's presence unafraid. You may be seated. Welcome. Welcome to Westminster. It is so good to be with you this morning. If you're new with us, a special welcome to you. It is such a joy to be here with you. I do invite our newcomers, our old timers, to uh, join us after worship in Finley Hall, which is right out these doors and to the left. We have their coffee and tea and snacks, and it's a wonderful chance to get to know each other, to be in conversation with one another. Um, to that end, I invite those of you sitting here in the middle to grab that P register during the offering time. Uh, go ahead, put your name on it. It's a great way to see the names of people that are sitting near you. Um, if you're new with us, if you want to put some contact information there, we're happy to be in touch with you with more information about the church later in the week. Let's join now in our community prayer. Let us pray together. Creating one. We pray for your renewing spirit. We recognize ways in which we may have fallen short in what we have done or left undone. We come seeking you that we might experience your grace, that in receiving your love, we might be molded into more compassionate and loving people. Plant in us the knowledge that you did not send Christ into the world to condemn, but to bring forth from it its divine potential. Empower us to do the same. Amen. Our prayers continue in quiet.
Amen. Friends, know that God always provides a path to wholeness and to renewal. Know that God has mercy on us always and is generous with forgiveness. For in Christ we are set free, we are made new. Thanks be to God. Amen. So as our time of prayer continues, um, now is the time when we like to share with one another. Share the joys and concerns that are on your heart. Share the ways that we might be in prayer for and with one another. So if you have something to share, I encourage you to just raise your hand and let us know. Chuck. Congratulations. In case you couldn't hear Chuck, he um, and Jenny are grandparents for the third time, their first grandson born this past week. Congratulations. Others? Joys or concerns to share with us? Oh, over here, yeah, Amanda. So Amanda prays for Morgan, the 14-year-old friend of Amanda's son, who has had a recurrence of cancer, um, has already experienced many miracles in her young life, Amanda says, but now is um, accepted into a clinical trial in Boston. So they're traveling back to Boston to get more details about that, but it'll be administered here in San Francisco. So prayers for Morgan and her family. Others? Yeah, Carol. Prayers for Carol's friend Freddie, who, uh, whose daughter recently died, is getting buried today, and then also for that friend's I guess, grand, no, daughter, who's 21, who has lost her mother. Yeah, I saw a hand over here. Clark? Joy, thanksgiving, and concern mm -hmm. for heaven's overly generous precipitation. <laughs> <laughs> Clark's offering both a joy and a concern for the overly generous precipitation. <laughs> Amen. Others, I saw someone back here. Yes. Sounds like it's Amy's birthday. Congratulations, happy birthday. And it sounds like it looks like you have a family too with you. So that's wonderful. Welcome to all of you. Yeah, Jeff. I was checking in with Blue Bear this morning and her son had a bike accident. He spent three days in the hospital. Uh, they were bleeding all around his brain, but his brain wasn't. We fortunately he's home now and has a long recovery and there's a lot of concern and that can lead to caring for him and paying bills and everything. Absolutely. Muha Bear, our beloved nursery attendant, her son is 20s? Is that about? Yeah, her adult son um, had a head injury this week uh, in a bike accident, was in the hospital for a couple days, is now home, um, but has a decent road to recovery ahead of him. So prayers for Muha Bear and her son. Yeah, Carol. So Carol's 91-year-old friend having a heart valve replacement, and then two of our congregants, Anita Lowe, having a knee replacement tomorrow, and Denny Drake, who had emergency unexpected abdominal surgery last week and is still recovering in the hospital. Do you have one more? No? Patty? Praise of joy um, for being able to sing with the Marin Symphony. Ah, yeah, praise of joy for singing with the Marin Symphony. Amen. All right. Yeah, Michael.
started popping aspirin, and by the time they got over land, they, he got to the hospital, got two stints, and, and he's fine now. Um, but he, through the whole experience, he felt a sense of peace and comfort and presence. Mm -hmm. So I have uh, gratitude that he's okay. Mm -hmm. Amen. So Michael recently had lunch with a friend from high school, Steve, giving thanks for a long-term friendship, and then sharing that Steve um, had a heart attack mid-airplane flight, um, was able to get care once he landed and is okay, and Michael was sharing that um, his friend, during the whole time, felt this sense of presence and peace and giving thanks for that. All right, that's a lot to hold in our hearts, and I know there are many that are unspoken as well. So. Let's have a couple moments of quiet, and then we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together. So let us be in prayer. Gracious God, you hear the prayers of your people, and they're offered in the name of the one who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. thing with
So, I brought something with me today. Oh, oh. I want you could you could see you could see. Oh, you saw him all the way over there. You noticed? Oh, you were sitting that close. Could you smell it? Okay. So what do I have here? Donut holes. This is wow. All of you got excited. Wow. Yeah. So. It's the second reason people come to church. We won't go. So, donut holes. Now, how many of you could eat all of these right now? Now, now I have a, but I wonder. He said he only wants salad, or just lettuce. So, I, I wonder, how exciting is it to eat a donut hole? Is it just, is it really good? Is it the best? Like I eat them all. But I wonder, what if you ate, what if that's all you ever ate was donut holes? You ate donuts for breakfast, lunch, you have the perfect expression, because you just think, what? What if you had donuts for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Would it still be exciting? No, it wouldn't be exciting anymore. And so sometimes, is it, po <laughs> I guess you would, <laughs> so it's, you might choke on eating too many donuts. It's true. It's it's, so it could be dangerous to eat too many donuts. So that's a good question. Would you get to drink water if you ate nothing but donuts? Yeah. So, well, I wonder this. So I'm not going to let you have these. But I bet if you're, if you're good, boys and girls, you'll get to have one after. Uh, sacred stories or kids things later today when you ask your parents I'm sure you can get one then uh, and it's exciting we give up certain things and we let go of certain things and it becomes more exciting and right now between the days of Ash Wednesday and a day you're, you've heard of like Easter a lot of the people in this room have decided to give up certain things in our house my children they gave up chocolate so they don't eat chocolate for 40 some days some of you look wow and it's hard, but guess how exciting it is when you finally get it. There are a lot, I notice on our calendar, we have a lot of things on our calendar. We have a lot to do sometimes. We have a lot of schoolwork, a lot of activities. And sometimes it's good to just let go of things. And I wonder what kinds of things you might let go. Now, unusually today, the surprise today is that we're going to use some things we don't normally use. So some of you are going to get to use some instruments today. Some of our middle and high schoolers are going to get to use a power saw today. Uh, so we get to use lots of different things. <laughs> Someday you'll get to, okay? Promise. So let's go see what kind of unusual things we might give up or we might get to uh, play with today. Or not play with, safely. Uh, use safely. Use safely. So those who are, uh, can I have our pre-K, have our sacred stories in our third to fifth grade person. There we go. All right. And middle and high school can follow me. Today's uh, reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after being grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water 
and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished at what I have said to you. You must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it. But you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I had told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No, one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whomever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. <coughs> John 3.16 may be the most well-known Christian scripture. At least it breaks the record for the most appearances in 1980s football games behind the field goal. Someone would inevitably be holding a sign with that citation. But many people, Christian or not, can recite it. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son, that all who believe or all who trust might not perish but might have eternal life. Well, if that's the most well-known verse, then the verse that follows may be the most often overlooked and forgotten verse, but it's equally important. Indeed, God did not send the Son, the Christ, into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved or rescued through this one. You see, that larger context of John 3.16 matters. And what a shame it is that this statement that Jesus makes in John's gospel of God's universal love, God so loved the world, the whole world, right? taken that universal statement of God's love and turned it into a litmus test about who gets to be in, which is only a few people, not to mention other species, but some select people. When 317 clearly says that's not the work of the Christ, is to go and to condemn people and start to level out who's in and who's out. And furthermore, the story that precedes those two verses I just cited is important context as well. The story of Nicodemus, which talks about and, is, and reminds us of the already existing presence of the kingdom of God. It's not just coming, it's already here. And we really just need to learn to see it. And the way we access that ability to see it is by being born again, or born anew, or born from above, or born of spirit, as the images go on to say. And who gets to be born of spirit? Anyone. It's a universally available good. And so sad that we have sometimes turned it into this uh, exclusive piece when it was intended for anything of the op but the opposite. You'll remember, of course, that uh, John was writing to a community that had been kicked out of their religious community. So he's trying to offer them assurance about their inclusion. And he's saying, don't worry about in or out or this or that. Just be born of spirit. That's all you need. Well, as we talk about all this birthing, it's worth taking a moment to appreciate our own birth. So think back. I don't mean back to your beginning. 
I mean back. The universe is as old as the scientists tell us. We're talking about 13.7 billion years. More than we can actually get our heads around. More on that in a moment. In other words, God has been conceiving of you for a long time. The earth has been conspiring to produce you for 13.7 billion years. Now, I tell you that not that you might, uh, in an egocentric way, put yourself at the center of the universe, but rather to ground you in this longer cosmological story that began with the great birth and continues to unfold through birth and death and rebirth over and over again. This is the universal pattern. But just take a moment to open yourself to the miracle of your existence. What grace, a gift freely given, did you do anything to earn your birth? What beauty. Sometimes that grace and beauty is so much, as we kind of said last week if you were here, that we can't take it. It's too overwhelming. In fact, when you read in Scripture, the response to someone encountering God in our sacred stories or uh, God in Jesus, the response is almost always one of awe. In Greek, the word is thaumazo, which I just say so you think I know something. It was totally not important to use that. My own insecurities come forth. People are always in awe of God when they encounter the divine presence. In fact, you might think next time you have an experience of awe, you might be in the presence of the divine. And it's so much awe that it borders on fear. So what do the angels almost always say when they show up? First thing they almost always say, don't be afraid. I know this is overwhelming. It's such an overwhelming um, encounter that it demands a response from us. You can't just experience the divine without being changed and wanting to do something in response to it. Uh, A colleague of mine shares about how his predecessor has a refrain. He used it in a particular sermon, but I think he must have used it a lot. And he would say this simply. It's an interesting way to articulate this phenomenon. God loves you. Now deal with it. The first part of that is the part we tend to get wrapped up in, and we say it so much, well, I hope we've said it so much, that that it's actually lost its meaning. God loves me. Okay, yeah, God loves me. God loves me. Yeah, okay. But, you know, so what? That's why I love that second sentence. Now deal with it, which says if you can open your heart big enough to accept that truth of the universe conspiring for our birth, of God accepting you, then you have to do something in response to that. It'll move you into a new way of being. Now, the typical way we respond, which is not a bad way, by the way, is to want to uh, respond in service, to give something back. It's the right impulse. We should be applauded for it when we nurture that. And we'll say more about it in a little bit. It's interesting. Service works for us because it plays into our comfort zone of productivity in this culture, right? The way you respond to something good is, I'm going to make some things. Now, it's good to make some things for some others. That's a laudable thing. But it's interesting to notice that that's where we turn because service also doesn't upset the apple cart, right? It just plays into the system we have and tries to sprinkle a little goodness in it. It doesn't tend to ask a whole lot of questions, plays into our productivity, into our desire to kind of get along. It doesn't do, for example, what, what, what justice does, because justice isn't productive. In fact, justice work is necessarily counterproductive, because it says, wait a minute, wait a minute, about something that is going on. And we don't want to play into this. We want to shift directions and look over here. What this lifts up for me is, uh, there's nothing wrong with being productive, by the way, but there's more to life than making things just to introduce to the marketplace. 
There's a deeper understanding of making in response to the experience of the divine that we should explore. It's no coincidence that when he was working for the freedom of his people, Gandhi made it a part of his work to make his own clothing. Interesting, isn't it? Even if just as a symbolic act, to remove himself from that particular economy and to make his own clothing and to take his people and say, we're going to make our own salt rather than to play into the system of the empire. So we're going to walk to the ocean, terribly inefficient, and we're going to start panning for salt. Interesting. There's other forms of making in response to an encounter that's sacred. There's the artistic. There's the aesthetic, which at times occupied a much higher place in our culture, and in some cultures still occupies a higher place. Place. But for us, it's not efficient. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to, it's not functional. And there's value to functionality. But we don't quite know what to do with it. So we kind of put it off to the side as something we do for fun. And we'll let a few people do it for a living. I've been listening to a lecture series from 20 years, 20, 30 years ago by Matthew Fox. And one of the things he talks about is how in our culture, by about age 10, about the age of my son, we beat the artist out of people. And it's in intentionally violent language, and boy, you can see it, the self-consciousness starting to come in, right? But art is actually essential. It's, um, it's common in our culture for people to say, oh, I'm not artistic. Oh, I, I'm not an artist. That would be unheard of to most of humans throughout most of human history, except they probably didn't have the, the separate category of art. It was just life. What do you do in response to the miracle of your existence? Of course, you dance. What do you do in response to the miracle of existence? Of course, you sing. You write poetry. You paint. You sculpt. I mean, look at all the hieroglyphics you see right up that hill, right? And yet we've decided to pull ourselves out of that, uh, some kind of discomfort. I said in the first service how much I talk, and Bethany scolds me lovingly, as does Ruthie lovingly, when I joke about how I can't sing. Shame on me for saying that. Everybody can sing. Everybody can sing. John Bell, famous hymn writer, Scott, Scottish hymn writer, goes around and, and leads workshops. I've seen him take a room like this. Um, and in, in five minutes has them singing three-part harmonies. It feels like magic, but he just pulls out what's already in there. And he says, in his whole life, he's met maybe enough people to fit on part of one hand who are actually tone deaf. But you go around the next time you're in a group and ask people who can sing, and almost all of them will say, oh, I can't sing. Oh, what a shame to not respond in making something beautiful for the world uh, as a response to what we've encountered. There's something more than uh, functional about the kind of making we're called to do. It leads me to ask, do we do enough art around here at the church? Fox says every church should have every night of the week a different artist doing um, prayerful art meditation. Do we do enough art around here? Well, okay, I'll, let's go back to our comfort zone. <laughs> oh, you can only take so much, right? It's unfair. It's unfair to spend the whole time talking about how you need to be someone else, right? You can lean into the goodness of who you are, right? I should be fair to you. The experience of the divine, or actually the absence of the divine, which you only know about because it's a shadow reflection of the divine, right? The ugliness of the world only offends you because you have an internal sense of the beauty of how it could be. This is why art matters, by the way, because it's a portal to the divine dream for creation. That's how you know the longings of, this, of what could be in this world as you tap into the, the artistic, okay? But we have that in us whether we can name it or not. Sometimes when we encounter the opposite of that, the ugliness, the hurtfulness of this world, we're just moved to do something about it. And that's service, which again is a beautiful thing. I don't know if the name Dmitry Muratov rings a bell to anyone. He won the Nobel Peace Prize. He's a Russian journalist. 
We're now a year into the war we thought would last a weekend. And way back in June of last year, Muratov took his medal and his earnings from the Nobel Peace Prize and auctioned them off and gave the proceeds $103.5 million to Ukrainian refugees. That's what happens when you allow yourself to be moved. Now, I typically protect you from stories like that. Why, what do you mean, protect you from stories like that? I do that because sometimes the best you can do is get through your week without yelling at your loved one or giving somebody the bird on 101, <laughs> right? I understand how hard it is just to be a decent person. And so if sometimes preachers just lambast their congregations with these extraordinary stories, which leaves everybody walking out feeling like they don't measure up. So I try not to do that too much, but today I don't want to protect you from that. Because today is about being born of spirit and learning to see in a new way. That's what the stories are about. You'll see totally differently when you open yourself to spirit. And I want you to be confronted with what you think is unimaginable and impossible and change your frame of reference to recognize what actually might be possible when we open ourselves to that kind of spirit. And what Muratov did is exactly the kinds of things we can do. And I don't care if you believe it yet. It's possible. And we're born again, born of spirit. But in the end, which is the beginning, right? Birth, death, rebirth. In the end, which is also our new beginning, it's not about your birth or your second birth or your birth in Christ or being born again or any of that. It's actually about what you will birth. Fox translates um, the 14th century mystic Meister Eckhart. And Eckhart said, what good is it that Mary gave birth to the Son of God 1,400 years ago if I don't give birth to the Son, the Christ, in my person, in my place, and in my time? We are all called to be mothers of God. It's not about your birth. It's about what we will birth. Lent, which we begin the season by marking with ashes and reminding ourselves about our death, is not about our death. It's about what we are willing to give birth to. Amen.
Amen. You may be seated. As we prepare to come to the Lord's table, we're reminded that all are welcome, all are invited to come to this table. When it's time, uh, the ushers will guide you down the center aisle, take a piece of bread from the plate or a gluten-free cracker from the center plate, dip it lightly in the cup, and then you can return to your seats by the side aisle. If it's uh, not comfortable for you to come forward, um, Chuck Quick is going to be a rover, so he can come to you, just uh, flag him down. Rob and I will be here at the front for a time of additional prayer, if you would desire that. And then we do like to sing while we receive communion, so there are a couple hymns listed in your bulletin. You're welcome to join in the song. Now, Jesus reminds us, invites us to come to the table in peace. So I invite you, as you are comfortable, to stand and share the peace of Christ with one another. Peace of Christ be with you. Friends, this is the joyful feast, the, the joyful feast of the kingdom of God. You may be seated. They will indeed come from north and south and east and west to sit together at table, where they'll be reminded that God so loves the world. God so loves the world that God gives of God's self that we might never forget it. And we come to this table to be reminded of it. And in our presence, remind one another of the sacred presence here. So come, all is ready for you. Will you join with me? God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God. Let us pray. Loving God, out of chaos, you called into life all that is good. Your heart, your hope, your love poured into those created in your image. Showering humanity with peace and mercy, you began to teach us all we needed in order to live in hope and in joy with you. Even when we turned away from you, you continued to speak of your promises, sending the prophets and sending your son, Jesus Christ, to share your faith in us. When he could have stumbled over our distrust, he called us to follow. When he could have remained silent, he declared your love for all. When he could have hidden his face in fear, he turned toward Jerusalem. Be with us now, O God, as we journey with Jesus to Jerusalem this Lenten season. And hear us now as we join our voices with those from every time and in every place who forever sing your praise. Friends, in the night of his arrest, Jesus did something beautiful. He took bread, and after giving thanks, he blessed it and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant, which is sealed in my blood. 
It is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it, he said, remembering me. This is the feast of God for the people of God. Come, for all things are now ready.
of hope. of joy. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for meeting us in this place. Bless us with new eyes to recognize that you meet us in every place. That the table we've experienced here is unfolding out in creation. Give us daring hearts to receive it and respond in kind. Amen. This time I invite Amanda Stevens forward for a word on behalf of the capital campaign. Good morning. Uh, for those of you I haven't had the chance to get to know yet, as Rob just said, I'm Amanda Stevens, a deacon here at Westminster for the past three years on the outreach committee with Kurt, Carol, Carol, Charlotte, just a few to mention. Um, and as such, I've been involved with Voyager Carmel, Bags of Love, Trans Heartline, and more. I'm also the chair of our current capital campaign. I know Rob and Rob Adkins have expertly spoken in the past weeks about the campaign, so I will only give a brief follow-up right now about its origins and importance. A number of years ago, we embarked on a building and renovation campaign that has turned out to be this glorious new space, this fortified, up-to-date, and code space. At the time, it was agreed upon by the leadership and congregation that loans, in addition to generous pledges, would be part of the financial package needed to accomplish the build. And here we are, enjoying the fruits of all the fundraising and construction labor, able to open up and meet greater needs of our congregation and wider community. In fact, just this afternoon at 3.30, a friend of mine from the community, Diane Kahn, is set to share about her nonprofit, Humans of San Quentin, as part of the new Westminster Events Ministry led by Aaron Elliott, whose husband David has been a tremendous help on the Capital Campaign Committee. To continue to dream and do more like this, we now want to retire the debt portion of the original campaign so we can better utilize the funds currently needed annually to pay the principal and interest, about 60 to 70,000. Our campaign's aim has been to raise a challenge goal of 750,000 and a stretch goal of 1.1 million. We began a quiet phase to accomplish this last fall, and if you haven't heard yet, then I am honored to share the news that we have already raised $770,000. Thank you. What a joy to be part of this ride that is now gaining the final steam towards, hopefully, our ultimate success. All of your faithfulness and generosity will get us there, I am confident, but not complacent. I do need and am excited to ask all of you to join in and play your individual parts as we all have a role in acting as the hands and feet of God here for and through Westminster. 
Now I ask all of this having also been in your shoes, although a bit more pointed and on the spot when Rob and Jim Buggy, our campaign fundraising consultant, asked me to meet last summer. I thought it was just going to be one of the quiet phase financial ask meetings, which it was, but it was also a call to serve as chair of the campaign, a call I initially didn't feel qualified to answer yes to. But what is that saying? That God won't ask you to do anything, he won't also equip you to handle? Well, that popped into my brain, and I just said yes. Yes, because of all that Westminster has given me and supported me with since I first walked through these doors years ago with my dear friend from college, Virginia Tusher. I found an open, inviting, intellectual, kind, caring community where I could bring all my questioning and doubts and even spiritual baggage, where I could recalibrate and turn away from the worldly measuring stick that is, so, that is often felt so keenly here in Marin, where I can serve and live out daily what I feel so fervently that we read in scripture, that we're here most importantly to love God with all our hearts and to love our neighbor, where I could exhale on Sundays and be held these past few difficult years, both due to the pandemic and also from being in a bit of the wilderness, so to speak, because of personal, many personal life changes. Throughout it all, my faith has deepened here, and Westminster and all of you and this campaign's success are very important to me. That's why I'm serving and giving with all my time and financial resources in a capacity where Westminster is first in my life, in my heart, in my focus, and in my philanthropic giving. And I invite you to join me and prayerfully consider doing the same when you receive your campaign letters that were just mailed on Friday. Please join me in prioritizing our very special Westminster Presbyterian Church according to your life's capacity. And then let's dream and move forward together doing God's work in our beautiful spot on this planet. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. And now, standing or sitting, let's join together in our closing hymn, 833.
Friends, as you go from this place, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God who is Father and Mother of us all, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen.